Well, I want to say good morning again to you all. And this morning, I'm looking forward to continuing in our series. Uh, we've been looking at our value of life together, and so we've been working on a series together about asking tough questions. And this is the way in which we want to move forward in a value like life together. Say, so it's great to have a value, but what are you doing with that church? And this is one of the things that we're doing around life together. Obviously, our fellowship times after uh, the church service, uh, that represents uh, life together, us being in a community. Uh, but also in the sermon series, being okay with bringing your tough questions that you have about Christianity here to this church and to be able to ask those questions. And it's okay for us to have some answers, and it's okay for you to wrestle with those, and that's often a beautiful mess. And the messiness of it is just being able to work together through those things in community. And so we don't want anyone to feel here at Pacific like you're not supposed to articulate questions that you might have about your faith. Rather, this is a safe place for you to be able to do that. Nor do we want anyone to feel like if they do have disagreements around the way that uh, an answer is shared or perhaps you differ in your interpretation of something, we don't want you to feel like you should have to leave this community or not be a part of this community. Rather, it's better for us to continue in conversation and to work on these things together. That's why we've been looking at some really tough questions, such as science and faith, friends or foes. I'm thinking of a real movie-type voice for that would be helpful, wouldn't it? Like a trailer voice, friends or foes. It didn't really work. Oh, well. Uh, we've also uh, asked, is the Bible reliable? Uh, we've asked, can we trust in God? Think of these very tough questions. Many people in the world asking these questions of Christianity. Many Christians asking these questions right now. What about peace? How can Christians talk about peace when there has been such a violent history surrounding the church? Tough questions, and today's question is a very simple question with some very profound meaning to it. It is the simple question, what is love? What is love? Now, if any of you have a 1990s dance tune now going through your mind after the phrase, what is love? I apologize. Try to get over that. And if other of you have no idea what I'm talking about, you didn't grow up in the 90s. It's as simple as that. Nor did I really, but uh, was aware of that tune. Moving on from that. What is love is an important question for us to ask because Christians truly believe that God is love and that love can actually be defined by understanding and looking at who God is. It's very important for us then to ask the question, what is love, and to be able to answer that, to be able to articulate that and understand it. And we as believers are also meant to love others. I mean, this is really the core of the Christian calling, isn't it? That we are meant to go out and be the love of God to others around us. And therefore, an understanding of what love is, is so important for us. Well, I think there are three ways that we can look at this morning uh, to be able to un understand uh, what love is. And remember, it's very important for us to understand this that when we are going through this series, we're not trying to, as pastors, deliver a fire hose of answers that are more like cliche answers. Like, here's the question, and here's all the ways that Christians have answered that, and boy, isn't it dumb to have that question after all, right? That wouldn't be helpful for us at all. But instead, we want to be able to offer what good people have thought through sometimes over centuries of thought about these questions, to offer these things to us all in order for us to be able to, again, have a conversation about that. So not cliche, but conversation. I hope that's understood then as we uh, look at these three things then, three ways that we can define what love is. 
The first is one of the ways in which the world defines love. So not how Christians define love, but one of the ways that the world defines love. And that is, number one, that love is an impersonal reaction. An impersonal reaction. You know, when I first met Debbie, my wife, I can still remember the moment. I can picture it in my mind's eye. If I close my eyes, I can still see her coming in to this room at camp that we had for where all of the new staff at camp were coming in to, uh, to start our first day as staff there. And I remember Debbie walking into the room. And I remember when she walked into the room, I thought, there is a beautiful woman. And, and I was attracted to her, and I saw her there, and she was a little bit less uh, blushing than she is right now, uh, but I, I definitely remember that moment as a very, very special moment. The question then about defining love would be this, was that simply a biological reaction for me of oxytocin and... Uh, some serotonin and some dopamine and chemicals in my body uh, that were simply doing what they're supposed to do through natural selection. And that is to uh, make an attraction something that moves from attraction into procreation and eventually into the preservation of our species. Well, that is a very biological Uh, approach to understanding what love is. And let me say that this is something that is very much popular right now uh, in the world and study of love. Uh, The the world uh, looks at love biologically to say it's actually just an impersonal reaction of chemicals. And that moment for me at camp may have just been simply that. Therefore, if this would be the case, then it would be, first of all, an internal reaction. It would be something, love is therefore something that's internal. It's chemicals within my own self, within my own body, that are there for the purposes, again, of preservation of our species. And in this way, then, it would be very impersonal. If this is what love is, then love is something that is not only internal, but it's something that's impersonal, meaning that we may feel like it's very personal in those moments, but those feelings are really just a result of eons of natural selection, and it's really nothing more than that. And so as we look at the popular um, discussion of this right now in the world, really that's how it does come across. Look, you may think that love is, is something, but it's just simply this. Serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin. That's developed over eons of natural selection so that you can preserve your species. Well, this may be a very popular view, and there may be efforts towards finding a love hormone that would uh, you know, be able to be pointed to and say, well, that's the reason why we have love. But does this really define love? Does this really define human love? I want to suggest that maybe the biology of attraction and staying with someone is not actually the definition of real love. I want to suggest that we know deep in our hearts, all of us, that there is something more going on with love than simply my biology. There's something else that's happening, and the problem with this just being an internal and impersonal definition for love is that really it all centers around me. Uh, If this is just what love is, then it's about me doing what I am feeling in that moment because, like an animal, I am just responding to my instincts. Well, I think that many in the world including those who are believers in Jesus, we have this sense that there is something else going on much beyond our instincts and far beyond an animalistic reaction, an impersonal reaction. 
Well, the, um, this is not a biblical uh, worldview. This is not a biblical view, rather, of what love is, an impersonal reaction. Well, here's the second way that the world can define what love is, as the world seeks to understand what it is. Secondly, perhaps love is an impersonal force, an impersonal force. First one is an impersonal reaction of chemicals. The second, an impersonal force. And, and the idea behind this force is there's something else going on here than just my chemicals. I am more than just my chemicals within me. There's something much more to me. And so the world says, no, actually, I think there's also spirit. I think I'm more than just my biology. I think that there is some kind of force that's involved in this world as well. And so the world says that maybe the gods are responsible for this explanation of a force that's going on with love that defines it much more beyond just a reaction of my biology. The gods are responsible. So this is ancient. This is a very ancient understanding of trying to explain what love is. The gods are responsible. The ancient Greeks believed that Cupid was responsible for it. The Romans, it was Eros. Maybe it was the other way around. But it doesn't matter. The idea that maybe there's a God that's involved in some way in humanity. And that's why in this way of a force that's at work, we know there's more going on with love. Perhaps the spirits are involved, the ancestors. There are unseen things like the universe involved. Now, I want to say that this word, or these two words, the universe, is the most popular Western worldview right now that is trying to explain what's going on in this earth that's beyond the physical reactions that we see happening around us. There is some kind of a force that most people in this world are able to recognize deep within themselves, but they just don't know what it is. And so, as we seek to understand what that is, as humanity, many people today believe that who's responsible for this? Well, it's the universe. The universe is responsible. Perhaps you've heard that before. Maybe you've seen it in some TV shows or maybe in some movies. And the idea is simply this, that the universe is set up in such a way that there's a return for the way in which we behave as people, or our actions, what we would understand as behavior or morality, maybe what the world understands as our actions. Well, the universe is this set-up system, and the system will then reward or return back payment against those whose actions are either evil or whose actions are good. That's the idea of karma, for sure, that's going on in this. But in a Western worldview, that word isn't even necessarily needed. It's just the idea that if I live in such a way and put good things out into the universe, the universe will repay me with good things back, eventually. Even if I have to go through suffering in my life right now, the universe really wants what's best for me. And actually, the universe has a good plan for my life. And the good plan for my life is happiness. And so this is an explanation that is extremely popular right now. And it's the same explanation that we've known for some time around this term deism. And, and this is a, trying to understand the world that maybe it's been set up by a god or an impersonal force. It's not really involved with us. But there is a return for the good things that we do or the bad things that we do. I want to suggest this morning that this is not a helpful way for us to understand love. I want to suggest this. Consider this today instead. Consider the fact that the difficulty with this is that we're trying to personalize something that is impersonal. The universe or the gods that are out there, humanity's way of trying to put personality to something that is unknown or unknowable. Yeah, putting personality to it. And it's still all about ourselves. Right? The definition then for love in this case is still created by us. We make it up. 
We give the names to these things that are out there. And really, it's all about us getting what we want in the end, which is happiness, something good to come out of our lives. Well, if this is a definition of love, then we are continually doing as best as we can do in the hope that somehow this impersonal force will return something good back to us that we know as love. And then we really hope that it's true love. And we hope that it's romantic love. And we hope that it's romantic love that lasts a whole lifetime. And we hope that it just keeps going and going and going, but it's filled with a self-centeredness that I don't think defines love the way that it should be defined, and it's certainly not the way that the Bible defines love. But very popular, and most of uh, the Western world for sure uh, believes in this. And it's sort of a, you know, how can you not believe in the time in which we live in, it's sort of a how can you not believe that the universe has a great plan for your life? Well, the reason why we as Christians want to suggest that there's another way for us to understand and to truly define love is because God is not here, according to the Bible, to make you happy. God of the Bible has not brought us into existence in order to fulfill our own desires for happiness. Rather, God came in order to bring us Zoe life. Now, let me be clear here that the universe as an impersonal force is set up to bring you happiness. But the God of the Bible has come in order to bring you Zoe life. A quick reminder of Zoe being the Greek word for life, but it's a, a word that is defined with such rich meaning because it is often defined as life to the full to the fullest, and it is simply understood as this. Life to the full is to know God, and for God to know us, for God to be found in us, and for us to be found in him. It's extraordinary, Zoe life, and so when we look at the God of the Bible, what we see is that there is not just an impersonal force at work towards us for love, but in fact, number three, Here's the third way, and the Christians define love in this way. The Bible defines love as a personal outpouring. Not an impersonal reaction, not an impersonal force, but a personal outpouring. I want us to look at a scripture now that is going to help us understand then how a Christian defines love. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 10. And looking specifically at verse 10 right now. So as we who are followers of Jesus then look at those two definitions and we say there's something going on that's much further and much more beyond our biology. And by the way, that's just all about ourselves. And then the second one, if it's an impersonal force, it's still just about ourselves. We create these gods or create, put personality onto them in order to ultimately fulfill what we want. Then there's the third definition, and the Bible itself defines what love is. Look with me then at 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, because you may be at a place saying, well, what is it? What is love? This, says John, this is real love. I love this uh, verse because it really breaks down uh, very quickly to what we're looking for uh, as, uh, as humanity, as we're searching for this desperately. And if everyone in the world is desperately searching for this and coming up with different answers for this, I love that the scriptures, God has actually spoken. So it's not a deism, impersonal force, but there's a personality behind this. God himself has spoken to his people and has said this. Write this down, John, he said. This is real love. And the word love here is the Greek word agape. There are different Greek words for love, but there is a specific word chosen here, and it's the word agape. So you can know what love is, even by the definition of which Greek word John chose and God gave him for love, and that's agape. And that word can be very simply defined as unconditional love. This is real 
unconditional love. Not that we loved God. That's the first phrase then in the definition of agape love. It's not that we loved God. My friends, this is really a complete reversal or the opposite, let's say, a juxtaposition is a better word. It's a juxtaposition against the worldviews around us defining love. Those worldviews around us are all about us being at the center of love. It is about us. If it feels good, definition one, I'm going to do it. The universe has got to be out there. There's got to be something going on with spirit, but it's really all about me and what I want. I'll put it out so I can get it back. I'll be good so I can get good. But then there's this third definition that is extraordinarily different. It is unconditional love, and therefore, the definition begins with that phrase. It's not that we loved God first. It's not about us. It is really instead all about God and who he is. So personal, God, and who he is or what he has done, that's the outpouring. So it's a personal outpouring. This is real love. Not that we loved God, back to the verse, but that he loved us. That he loved us. This is extraordinary. The story of God actually being a personal uh, outpouring that has actually connected with his creation in order to show that he loves us. The best way that we can illustrate this, God's love for us, is actually the next phrase in verse 10. It's the best way for us to define agape love. It's the best way for us to define how God is love. And so here is that next phrase. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And here it is, the best way to illustrate agape love, that he sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So, God himself becoming one of us at Christmas time, in order for the love of Jesus to be displayed for all to see through the cross, that if we might believe in him, our sins, as 1 John 4.10 tells us, our sins might be forgiven. And the purpose behind that is to bring us into relationship with him, to bring us into that agape love with him. So it matters. Sins being forgiven matters. That's all about God doing the work, not us doing the good enough work so that something we hope might come back to us that we call romantic love, but rather that it's God's action towards us. And God's action on the cross is the ultimate example of unconditional love. It's selfless love, sacrificial love. Well, Christians love this. When we, when we start talking about this, we, we get excited about this because really we know this is at the core of what we believe in. It's, it's what we call a key. Like there's a key to this, right? The key is sacrificial love, unconditional love. So if you were to ask me, you know, Pastor John, what's the key to love? Uh, how about this one? What's the key to loving relationship in my marriage? What's the key to love in my home? Is there a key to love in this church? If we're going to move forward and love, how, is there a key to it? There is. There actually is a definition given to us. There's an example given to us. There is a path forward for us. Agape love is the pathway forward for us, and so it is sacrificial Selfless love. It's not about us. It is about the other. This is defined so well in the person of God himself. God himself in three persons. Right? The Trinity is the great way to understand unconditional love. The Father is for the Son. The Son is for the Father. The Father and the Son, they send the Spirit to us. And so there is unconditional, selfless love in the Trinity and we are meant to live out that. Um, we are meant to live out that great example for us. So, I want to encourage you today with this third example as something that you might consider. If you are wondering to yourself, what is the difference between how the Christians define love and the world defines love? This I want to offer to you is a way for you to understand love from a Christian understanding, biblical understanding. And that is that we are not at the center of it, 
but that God is. And it's really defined best by who he is and his outpouring of love through Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you to investigate that, yeah, to press forward in that. So if, you're, if you don't know that yet today or you don't believe that yet today, I want to encourage you to come forward into that and to, and to investigate this truth about Jesus being that perfect example of love. As well, I want to encourage you as Christians today, perhaps you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, but you've come today and maybe it's possible that you're operating in your life under that first definition. If it feels good, you do it. And the church has been guilty of this so many times, haven't we? And, and you know, the world can point to uh, the church often and say, you're operating just like uh, definition number one. You're just operating on your chemicals and your, if it feels good, you want to do it. It's true. We've been like that many times. In, in that case, what we're doing is we're living out this, what the Bible calls our sinful nature, right? And, and instead, what God is calling us to is to not have ourselves at the center of this, but to actually have God at the center of our lives and of our love, and so to move away from that. And I want to encourage you today, if you've been stuck in definition number one, I want to encourage you to move away from that. Yeah. And here's the, the second one then is, maybe as believers, you've also been stuck in definition number two. And here's how Christians do this. We get stuck in definition number two when we think that if we're good enough, God will respond back with good things for us, including love. He'll love us more. Or we'll get love out there. Or our love will be better here on earth. But that's not the way that it's set up, in fact. It's set up in such a perfect and beautiful way. And that God is already the one who has moved first. It's not that we loved, but that he moved first. And so I want to call you all as believers to this third definition and to live into that. Let me finish with how John describes it then in the rest of these verses moving forward. Listen to these verses. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. That's Zoe life. Full expression in us. Don't we desire that here at PCC? Don't we want to see that in this community? Full expression. The Zoe life. Verse 13. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he is in us. That's, a, that's agape love. We are in him and he is in us. That's the way to define it. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the father sent his son to be the savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. I want to conclude then today by asking you and calling you to put your trust in God's love. And we have a wonderful way for us as Christians to practice that, to participate in that, and to enter into it. And it's at the Lord's table. I want to encourage you to take out your communion elements at this time and encourage the worship team to move forward at this time as well. As we come before the Lord's table, we are coming before that great expression of love that I talked about earlier, that God has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Great sacrifice, giving of himself for us. This is what love is, says John. God is love, says 1 John, and this is how we know what love is. The father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. I'd like us to come before the Lord now in prayer before we take communion together. Let's pray. And so, Father, we come before you and we are so grateful for your love for us. 
We love you so much, God, and we're so grateful for what you have done, which is represented here in this bread and in this cup. God, I pray that you would do a great work in us, that we would not live defined by our chemicals, nor that we would live defined by an impersonal force that's out there to help us. And forgive us, God, for when we've treated you like this. But instead, Lord, I pray that you would help us Help us to define love as you have done through the cross. And so now, Lord, as we take this bread and as we take this cup, uh, tangible ways in which we remember true love, oh, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work in us uh, so that we might experience more selfless love in us, uh, that we might live out the cross, and we might daily take it up in our marriages, in our homes, with our children, with our friends, and here in our church, with our enemies, Lord, with those who seek to persecute us, with those who hate us. Oh God, it's only by you that we would be able to move forward as this bread and as this cup represent. It's only by you. So, Lord, I pray that your spirit would do that work within us. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke this bread and he said that this bread represented his body, which was selflessly broken for us. He asked us to take that and to remember him. And at the same time, he also took the cup after supper and he said that this cup represents his blood which was shed for us for the remission of sins so that we might be in relationship with him. God in us, us in him. Let us take this and remember him.